Good morning, Open Door. How are we doing out there today? Wanted to start today. Uh, just want to say thank you. I was uh, getting ready this morning and reflecting on it's been, I believe, seven years that Pastor Jim and you people were crazy enough (laughs) to allow me uh, the position to be a pastor here in this church. Um, And so I just want to say thank you. I love the calling that God has put on my life, and I love the people that I get to do it with. Um, I love you guys so much, and I love what we're doing here at Open Door. I really do. I take it very seriously, and I think, and I know so many of you do as well, and that's why today is going to be a little bit different uh, for me and hopefully for you. When you love people and you're in a relationship where you care about one another, every once in a while, you got you to gotta have one of those talks, like a serious talk, Right? Someone looks at you and says, man, we, we got to sit down and talk. And I'd like to have a serious talk with you today. Um, you guys know me. I like to be a little playful. I like to keep things light. But just by the title of my sermon here, I want us to know I, I'd like us to get serious today. God has something heavy on my heart, um, something he wants to deal with all of us, so Let's get serious. With that being said, let's jump right into our passage. We've been taking a look at this amazing letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the people of Ephesus. Uh, We've been unpacking many things, but now we're in the section dealing with our minds and how we think. So I want you to jump into chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 27. When you have that, go ahead and stand up to your feet. Join me. If you don't have it, we're going to put it up here on the screen for you. So this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to those people. And this is what God is speaking over all of us today. It says this, Therefore, and I want to stop real quick because if you're a student of the word, you know when any time you see a therefore, you know something preceded that. You have to ask what this is there for. So real quickly, again, in this section of the letter, Paul has begun to talk about, he's talked about who we are in Christ, and now he's talking about how to put it into practice. And now we have to get our minds right. And he's talking about how He's he's written how we can't live like the Gentiles, like the world does anymore. They have some wrong thinking up in here, some dark thinking, some thinking that is separated from God. There's things we got to get out of our mind. There's things we got to get out of our life. We've got to put off the old and put on the new. So that's what the therefore is speaking about. So therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. I think it's always important at times, guys, to look around every campus. This isn't individualism here. We're all part of one big body in him. And we know these last two verses, and this is where we're going to spend the chunk of our time this morning, but I hope you really take these in today the words that the Apostle Paul writes to us, in your anger, do not sin. Some interesting quotes around that. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. So you can have a seat. So again, we're we're dealing with this idea of things that gotta go, things that gotta come, what it's like now being in him. How do we live these things out? And again, we're talking about trying to say we're in a, hopefully, we're in a committed relationship to one another because we're in a committed relationship to God to become like his son. So as followers of Jesus, the first thing we're gonna learn from this very clearly is that, man, we have to be committed to be truth tellers. 
Isn't that so important when you're in a relationship with, with someone you love, when you're in a serious relationship? It's important, so important to speak the truth in love. If you have kids, if you have children, you know the importance of this. If you have a spouse, you know the importance of If you have a best friend, someone in your life like this, you know it's so important that we tell the truth and get rid of the lies. And guys, if we're honest, so many times we lie to each other and we lie to ourselves about what God really thinks, about what God really sees. And we've been trying to hammer on this because the Apostle Paul hammered on this for three chapters. So again, before we go any further and we get into the, the crux of this, I just want to remind us again who we are. Who does God say we are? Because as Pastor said last week, what you think about who you are, what you think about each other, is in a very real way gonna determine so much of how you live, right? What's going on up in here in this goofy little thing at times, what it's saying is gonna determine exactly how my day goes, how my conversation goes. And so we keep talking about it and we have to because so many of us do not live in this place where we know and understand and have identified with the fact that God absolutely, positively, adopted me. He adopted you. Let it sink in again. Signed in blood, the paperwork. That's my boy. That's my girl. Willingly chose us to be his beloved. Should take our breath away every time. So the God of the universe who knows everything sees us. Just, just let this list hit you again. I love how the Apostle Paul, over and over, because he's a truth seeker and he wants people to know their identity, look at how he addresses his letters to people. He begins this letter to these people, to God's holy people. Man, I'm writing to the faithful. I'm writing to the people faithful in Jesus. And I want you to know in a very real way today, that's who I'm preaching to. God's holy people. Everybody listening to this, everybody in every campus, the faithful, that's who I'm talking to, that's who God wants to talk to. Guys, this is so much of what we're trying to do, and if you've experienced anything from Jesus, you know the thrill of how that feels. And you're highly motivated then, knowing that in your mind, to go out and live in a certain way and shine so others can know this same truth about who they are. And that's why it's, it's so important that we know that anything Anything not found in Jesus is not to be found in us. It's not to be found in this body. It's not to be found in our mouth. It's not to be found in our online profiles. We got to ruthlessly, again, get rid of that junk, get it out of here and make sure our life, who we are, lines up with who he is. And I want to stop there again because I want to go right back to talking about knowing the truth about who we are and being truth tellers to the people out there yet that don't know who they are. And specifically because there's this huge issue in the world today. And it's not just in the world, it's rampant in the church. And it's the issue of anger. So interesting how Paul brings us up early on. I don't need to tell you what's happening with anger in the world today. We can clearly see it. But I think what should disturb all of us is how this is infiltrated into the church. The church of America, the church of the world, and the church right here at Open Door. People that claim to follow Jesus. People that show up here on Sunday, a lot of them in life groups, saying things that Jesus would never say. Boycotting places and people that Jesus would never boycott. Having attitudes and posts, things that Jesus would never do. There's an anger that should disturb the church, the body of Christ right now. 
And before, again, we get too crazy with this, I want you guys to know and understand something. Followers of Jesus get angry, don't they? I'm a follower. I get angry. I felt like as I was preparing for this sermon, God was trying to give me like multiple sermon illustrations to illustrate how followers of Jesus get angry. Case in point, a lot of people evidently had been trying to contact me over the past two, three weeks, and we're not having much success. Unbeknownst to me, I was getting certain calls and texts, other ones I wasn't. For some reason, my phone stopped receiving calls from Android Verizon users. I didn't know this, but I'm trying to figure this out with my cell phone company. And let me tell you, I almost lost my salvation a few times. Get angry. I mean, I'm paying for a service, right? And it's not being fulfilled. Should I get angry at that? Should I feel angry? I think that's understandable, right? Aren't there things we should get angry at? And sometimes we get angry at things that we shouldn't, but anger happens, doesn't it? So it's a beautiful thing, again, about telling the truth, guys. One of the big points that Paul's making in this verse is he's saying, in your anger, okay? It's going to happen. A lot of translations here, maybe in your Bible, it says, be angry. It's interesting because this is the verse a lot of times people use to say, okay, this is why I have a right to go off. This is why I have a, the Bible says be angry. And that's an accurate translation, by the way. What Paul is doing, the reason that's in the quotes, he's quoting King David in Psalm 4. It's saying when when David was writing that, he was saying, man, tremble and do not sin. If you click on your Bible there, you see that is Paul literally quoting the old Hebrew Psalm there. So they're trying to translate this word for anger. Isn't that how anger feels, right? You just, you just start shaking, man. So he's saying it's gonna happen. You're gonna get angry. You're gonna feel it, right, wrong, or otherwise. But the point is to what? To not sin in our anger. Well, what does that mean? At what point is going off sin? Is, is what point what I'm thinking sin? I like to think of it like this, man. We get angry, but we're not to be given to anger. Isn't that a powerful word? You know, I do weddings from time to time, and a lot of times at the beginning, I'll be standing up here and I'll say, you know, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Who gives her? And the father and mother will respond. We're not to be given to anger. And for some reason, I don't understand it. I really don't. It, it, it seems to be a thing. It's almost cool in Christianity now to be an angry follower of Jesus. Man, it's time to stand up. You know, we're not doormats, you know? We gotta rise up. We gotta legislate. We gotta band together, you know? It's time. Guys, there, there is no way you would come across the conclusion that we're to walk around and be angry from just a short study of God's word, from just a quick look at the life of Jesus. There's no way you'd come to that conclusion. We're students of the word. We're not drawing our own conclusions. Just just a few verses for you. Wise people are slow to anger. Refrain from anger and wrath. In fact, in your relationships, you shouldn't be kicking it and hanging out and giving yourself to people who are given to anger. New Testament, put away anger. James, man, could we use this one today? Everyone should be quick to listen. What are you saying, man? Slow to speak. Let me let them have their turn. Slow to become angry. Is that you? Oh, and if you're wondering, the verse in Ephesians that sometimes people use, spoiler alert, just a couple verses later, In this book, Paul is going to tell us to what? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Don't they all go together? Don't they all go together? What about God? He's angry, right? Over and over, we see the Bible describe God as feeling anger, sometimes responding in anger. But look at always, he's compassionate. He's gracious, he's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The fact that we're all sitting in this room, the fact that Johnny J is still alive on planet Earth is proof positive that God is slow to anger. What about Jesus? 
flipping the tables, right? Jesus gets mad. Oh, he gets mad. It's never how you describe him. The only time Jesus gave a self-description of himself, he says, I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. So I want to deal with that first. Anger, being given to anger, is not a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a mark that should follow Christians around, which is why Paul's talking about it. And then he tells us something very important to to dealing with our sin, to dealing with making sure we're not given to it. It says, listen, before that orange ball hits the horizon, before that, that thing sinks down and you climb in your little bed at night, you better offload this stuff. You better get rid of it. You better make it right. How amazing would your life be, just your life, your relationships, if you could put this one little, one little thing from God's word into practice in your life? If as a man, you said, I refuse to go to bed at night mad at any coworker, angry with my spouse, I'm gonna make it right. I'm gonna say I'm sorry. I'm gonna kiss her. As a woman to make sure that in no way am I gonna allow any friend to think I'm angry with them before this day ends. I will not let my children end the day knowing anything except the mother's love. Just this one verse What would change in your life? What would change in the world if just we as a group of Christians never went to bed angry? Is it possible? It's clearly possible. It's in God's word. And why does Paul warn us against this? Man, guys, we need to read our Bible and read it carefully and let these things sink in. He says, because when you let that happen, When you hit the pillow and you haven't sought forgiveness, when you haven't given this back to God, something terrifying happens. Are you reading what I'm reading? Let me just get that last part down there, man. We are giving the devil, the devil, demonic power, a foothold in our life, in our home. Yeah, that should shake us up a little bit. All the things we're worried about in the world and that the sun going down on my anger allows something that dark and that sinister to come into my life, to come into my home. That's serious. And this word foothold here, it's an interesting word. It's the Greek word for topos. I just want you to hold that on for a minute. So so I want us to think about something, man. Why would we ever then do that? Why would we go to bed angry? And haven't we all done it? Johnny J has done it many times. Haven't Some of you went to bed last night. Why would you do that knowing you're gonna give the devil a foothold in your life? Well, guys, it's, we're, we're all trying to answer the same question. So much of our walk with God, so much of all spirituality boils down to this epic question, man. What do I do with this hurt? What do I do with this wrong? What do I, where do I take this pain, man? What do I do with it? The sin, the wrong that I've committed against people. Because man, isn't that what, what comes for us a lot, guys? Thinking about that at night, the things we've done, the anger at ourself. What do I do with the stuff that's been done against me? The things that people have said, the things that people have done wrong, horrible things at times. What do we do as we walk through this broken world and we just have to watch other things that are terrible? They hurt, they should anger us. Where do I take it? What do I do with it? And that's why that word, topos, is so interesting. It's the only time it's translated foothold. This is my fancy little thing. I can click on words in my little logos program. It's going to tell me. So when I pull it up there, it is topos. It's a place. When I let the sun go down, I keep that anger. I keep that thought. I'm giving the devil a place. I'm giving him a position. I'm giving him a task. I am giving him a room, an area, a seat. Again. That should terrify us. We're worried about a virus. We're worried about what's happening in Afghanistan. 
and we're gonna willingly let this happen in our life? I want you to think about relationships again, guys. Anytime we're, we're thinking about, we're talking about important relationships today, right? You know, being serious in our relationship. Every relationship pretty much starts with an introduction, right? And from, from the get-go, you're trying to figure out, do I wanna keep it going with this person? You know, what, do we jive? Do we have some of the same interests? And maybe after you have a couple friendly hellos, you might decide, hey, we should, we should grab lunch or coffee sometime, right? It gets a little bit more, you know, serious. And man, if things go good there, you might even like have dinner together as friends, as romantic interests right now. But things take a whole new level when you decide, I'm so serious. I'd like to give you my address. I'd like to bring you over to my house, man. I'd like you to meet the family, you know? And how serious would you have to be with somebody to say, you know what? We don't even want you to leave tonight. We got a place for you right here. We're enjoying you. Don't go home. Why don't you just stay? And again, every time we do that, we are letting, by letting that anger go down, we are allowing the enemy, something dark, something sinister, not, not just in our life, not just in our home with people that we claim to love. We're letting it sit at the foot of our bed and chirp at us and talk and counsel. And what does the devil love to do, man? Trash the people that you love in your life. Speak lies about things that your coworker said. Speak lies about the reality. And you'd think, wouldn't you? Seeing something like this at the end of our bed, we'd be like, get out of here. But what do we do? No, we listen. Yeah, my, my spouse never did appreciate me, man. <laughs> Maybe I should just go. Maybe they'd appreciate me then. These bratty little kids and my boss that I can't stand. In Cleveland, they'll start tr trashing the area that you live, guys. And you know what? We're good to know his name. The slanderer, the accuser, the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy. And again, instead of telling him after he's trashing all these people to get out, no. Now we let him start talking to us. And all that anger starts getting directed to us, right? You know what? You are always angry all the time. People at work are sick of your attitude and your trash. Your spouse would be better off with someone else. In fact, maybe everyone would be better off without you. Lying, stealing, unresolved anger. It's like a long, bony finger tugging at the sutures of the deepest wounds of your life. It's like a black viper coiled up under the covers, slithering around your chest where you can't breathe at night anymore. You're so anxious and spun up. It's like a dark, formless object right underneath the surface of everything, swimming and swirling and big, bringing up every worst trait, every worst scenario you've ever imagined. Unresolved anger is a wall separating you seemingly from every good thing in life. And from the beginning, guys, from the beginning of time, we have seen God himself try to deal with this issue of not letting people to go to bed angry. Do you remember when he spoke to Cain? And Cain's sacrifice was not accepted and Cain was angry and his face was downcast and, and God saw it and he said, listen, Cain, I'm gonna tell you something right now. This is at the beginning of the book, guys. Something real dangerous has happened, buddy. Before you go to sleep tonight, there is something crouching there. There is something coiled there. It desires to have you. But God said something so interesting to Cain. But you, you must rule over it. Guys, God will not force you to bend your knee to him. We're talking about surrender. That's what's so interesting about what we're talking about. Did you notice that, again, when we do those things, the devil doesn't trick his way in. The, the devil doesn't sneak his way in. It's not like a surprise pop-up box. It says you gave him the keys to the house. You gave him the garage code. You gave him the remote control. You said, here's your room. You surrendered 
at night to say, this is exactly what I'm gonna think about. And what is the antidote? Surrender. We're talking about surrender today, guys. Man, Jesus said, again, what do we do with our pain? What, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, what are you supposed to do? Sit down and think about it? Come to me. Come to me. So many people at night feeling that, that viper, that coiling around your chest, man, I just feel like the devil's at work right now. Like, how in the world do I resist the devil, man? How do I get him out of here? You submit to God. It's not a, this isn't even a battle, guys. When I submit to God, guess what? Devil has no place. Come near to God. He's gonna come near to me. We're talking about surrender. We're talking about our pain. What do we do with it, man? Am I gonna surrender? Am I gonna give it to him, to the enemy, to my mind to think about all night? Or am I gonna give it to God to do something with it, to transform it, to learn from it? Isn't that what God does with pain? Guys, he's so good at this. Every great story is God taking something that was meant for evil, meant for harm, and he does something amazing with it. Amazing with it. God loves to transform your pain. And I promise you, if you do not surrender that pain to God, if you do not give it to him and let God be God and let him work on it, you will transmit that pain to everybody. Isn't this what you see from two types of people? You have transformed people and they have people that walk around with their wall. I'm not gonna let anyone hurt me. And trust me, you can feel it, can't you? Oh, they're not saying anything, but they're saying everything. Where it's the people with their snarky comments, acting like they're a joke, and I'm just kidding and whatnot. And you can feel the anger under the surface of their sarcasm, of their joke at that politician or the Chinese people fill in the blank. It's the people spewing hate, transmitting their pain online to other people, to relatives. Be transformed by God or transmit that pain to everybody else. And what do people say all the time? Well, you don't know, John. You don't know what's happened to me. You don't know the hurt that I've been through. You don't know what they did to me. Guess what? You don't know what you did to him. And you don't know what he's done for you. How in the world could any of us stand at this place knowing what he's done for me, the high price that he's paid for me and have anything but love and forgiveness for my fellow man? Let's go back to where do we take our pain? You know why we take it to Jesus? You know why we take it to this place? Because this is where we find the truth. Let's go back to the pain of the sin that we've done. Isn't this where so much anger comes from? I can't get it together. What's my problem? And I come and I stand at the cross for the bajillionth time. God, I did it again. God, I said it again. Jesus, I forgive you. I love you. It's finished. You're adopted. You're chosen. You are beloved. Everything changes in this place, in this topos. And when I bring that same hurt from other people, guess what Jesus tells me? I'm not mad at your kids, John. I forgive them too. I love, I'm not mad at your boss. That's not how I feel. That's not how I think. Everything is transformed in the truth of who Jesus is. He loves to take us to the place we need to go. That's why we surrender to him. Jesus, when he walked into his hometown, says he went to the synagogue, he was getting famous. They wanted him to teach a little bit. Says they handed him the, the scroll of Isaiah, big old scroll. And it says, Jesus unrolling it, found the place. Same word, topos. Same word, totally different place. He found the place where it is written. What's it written, man? all about his mission, all about who he is. Man, look, listen to these beautiful words. I mean, he found this place. I'm anointed to do something here. I'm here not to proclaim judgment. I'm not here to boycott anything. I'm not here to call out all the bad people. I'm here to proclaim good news. 
Newsflash, you could never take your sin serious enough. I'm gonna take it seriously for you. I want you to take me and my love and my forgiveness seriously. That's good news. I'm here to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. All that stuff that you're feeling at night, all that anxiety, freedom for you. Recovery of sight so you can see the world is supposed to be, to set the oppressed free. Man, I'm here to proclaim favor, the Lord's favor. That's the place that Jesus went to. That's the place, the anointing that he came to do. And we're to become like him. Guys, what would it be like if you meditated on that type of place at night? Because listen, better days begin with better nights. That's the promise of this verse, man. What I think about, what I meditate on is gonna directly affect my life and how I think the next day. Pastor talked about this last week. What am I supposed to be attentive to? All the wrong in the world? All the people in my life? Or who God is and what he's saying? What his word says? Because our mind follows our focus. Our mind follows our focus. Again, going right back. Imagine laying in your bed tonight. All that hurt coming, it comes, doesn't it? Man, I'm feeling it. All the different things that have happened at work. I can't believe I did this again. And I can't believe my spouse said this. And feels a lot. Come to me, man. You're heavy laden. You got those burdens. Hearing the voice of Jesus. Man, come to me, John. My kingdom. My rule. What I think. Come to me. Tells me that I'm supposed to be transformed I offer my mind to God and I'm I'm to be transformed when I I make it new. I renew it in what God says. I'm not supposed to lay there and rehash the day. I'm not supposed to repeat the events of the day in my head. I'm not supposed to rehearse what I'd like to say, what I'd like to do. I'm supposed to be renewed. I'm transformed by being renewed about what God says about me, who I am. Again, pastor talked about it. It's How many of us can't breathe at night when that anger's hitting us, right? Your heart's pumping a million miles an hour. You can't sleep. You just feel all spun up like you're having an anxiety attack. Man, I'm being renewed by exhaling all those lies about who I am, what my sin is, and all the lies about the people in my life and what the devil and all that wants me to believe. Get out of here. I breathe that out. I breathe in God's grace. I breathe in his truth. All of our thinking, guys, all of our cognition then, this is what we're talking about, becomes recognition, recognition. When we begin to think and be renewed in his thoughts, who God is, who we are, what his word says, we begin to recognize things so differently. We begin to see the real fruit of God's work in our life, the love, the joy, the peace. How has he loved me? How has he brought joy? How has he brought peace? I begin to look and recognize and remember these things and think that way. That's why Paul is saying, listen, put off again the earlier self. Put off that old self. We don't don't think like that anymore, man. It's not about your thoughts. It's about his thoughts. That stuff has all been corrupted. You're to be made new where? In the attitude of your mind right up here. Made new in this thing. Put on the new self, who God says I am, beloved, chosen, adopted, created to do good works, because I'm created to be just like my dad. I'm created to become like Christ because the space that we live in is determined by the place that we are found in. Isn't it amazing how people can be in the same space and be in a totally different place? place. We've all seen this, haven't we? Someone walks in, you're in the best mood in the world, and here comes your coworkers, and you know they're not. They're not feeling it today. They're in a totally different place. The reason we find our place in him is because Jesus is the master of being in the same space, but being in a totally different place. They saw a little guy, Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, and they hated him because Zacchaeus robbed and stole from the people, ruined a lot of people's lives. He was a bad hombre. He was a bad guy. So what did they do, man? In that space, they hurled accusations. And when they hurled accusations, Jesus dropped an invitation. Zacchaeus, I want to come have dinner with you. Come down for that tree. 
It was Zacchaeus' salvation moment. Same space, totally different place. Woman was caught in adultery. Caught in adultery. This is bad, guys. Don't, don't whitewash this, man. She, she hurt people. She's wrecking a home. They're ready with rocks. And Jesus is ready with redemption. He wants her to see something different. Same space, totally different place. On the cross, they're looking at this man. They thought, they have to kill him. There's no way he can be God. Love these people, just forgive sins like it's no big deal. There's no way a man claiming to be God could do that. We gotta get rid of this guy. And the crowd was living to watch this man die. And there's Jesus, willingly dying. So that crowd, so you, so me, we could live. Same space, totally different place. Guys, hurt people, we've heard this, hurt people. Misery loves company. That's why this is so dangerous what we do when we don't offload our anger at night, when we don't surrender to God, when we let the enemy come in there. Because what God wants is a room full of people, a, a, a movement of people that are transformed because transformed people transform people. Isn't it amazing again how when you're around a transformed person, they are not angry about half the stuff that so many of you are angry about? They're not spun up about so many of these issues Because again, they're not hurt by people anymore. They're transformed. They hurt for people, but they're not hurt by people. And that's why I love the Apostle Paul again in his heart always, over and over. It's always, guys, about transformation. It's always about reminding people who they are. Again, I wanna go right back to the beginning, reminding who he's writing to and who I'm talking to. You know, a bunch of angry people out there a bunch of people that God's mad at. This is God's holy people, the faithful. And should we be mad? I'll tell you what, I'm mad today. We should be mad at certain things, and I'm, I'm angry that I have brothers and sisters, I have people in this church that I love that have lost relationships over politics. I'm angry that there's mothers in our community that haven't spoken to daughters over choices on a vaccine. I'm angry that there's men that have given up their God-given right to lead and love their families like Christ because they can't get over some arguments at work and that the wife just doesn't appreciate them. But my point is this, guys. I'm not angry at those people. I've learned, I don't get angry at myself anymore for being angry. I've learned where to direct my attention and my anger to. I know what to get mad at now. And I'm mad at the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy because he has no place here in our lives. He has none. And so rather than talk about it, I'm amazed at what it doesn't tell us here. It just says, don't do it, man. Don't let the sun go down. So how about we end right there? There's people in this room. There's people in V-Town. There's people in Avon Lake. There's people in Lorraine that walked in with this today. You've given it a foothold. And after a night, it's a foothold. But some of you, it hasn't been a night. It's been a week. It's been a month. It's been all of 2020. Some of you have hold on to some anger and hate for decades, and it's a stronghold, man. And you think there's no way I can get rid of this thing. He's all up in the place, right? What place do we go to? We go to him. We go to the word. And I wanna end with this, man. I I, I want you to find freedom in this. This is God's word. No one should walk out of here with that on their life anymore. No unresolved anger with anyone or anything because listen, we got some weapons today. We have weapons in this house. We have weapons inside of us. 
and they are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine, godly, Jesus power to demolish strongholds, that wall of anger. Divine power to demolish strongholds. So we demolish right now, join me, arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, who he is, who we are in him. And we take captive everything, every thought that comes against the name of Jesus, everything that comes against who we are in him. And we make it bend its knee and bow to him. Guys, it would be tragic. Again, serious talk, because I love you, for anyone to leave today with anything else but love in your heart for every person that you know. And there's people, again, that some of you have cut out of your life, sons, daughters, friends. How about we do business with God? We're gonna sing here in a minute, in him. The devil can't be with us when we understand we're in him. He has no part in him. We're gonna sing it. But listen, if there's a stronghold in your life, if you're feeling this, Man, I, I wouldn't know how to make it right with my dad. I wouldn't know how to make it right with my kids. It is, it's, it's not just a foothold, it's a stronghold. I don't do this a lot, but I'm gonna do it, man. It's time for you to get serious with God's word and demolish some stuff. You know what's a great way to demolish a foothold? Get your foot moving and come up here, man. Come up here in all of our venues and tell God, I'm done being angry at my kids. I'm done being angry at my spouse. I'm done letting anger sit at the foot of my bed and chirp at me and having a place in my house. I'm done. Your family needs to see it. Your spouse needs to see it. Your kids need to see it. It needs to be done. We're putting that stuff off. We're demolishing it right now. God's trying to set some of you free today and we love you enough to tell you you don't have to leave with that stuff on your life anymore. So as they're playing this song, and I'm being for real, for real, some of you need to take that step, get that foot moving, get his hand off your foot, come up here and let God know, man, I am in you because we are in him. So Father, I thank you right now. God, I thank you for your word. How, how beautiful and how powerful, God, that just right there in the name of Jesus, we can demolish all the wrong that the enemy has done with us. God, thank you for giving us freedom from this, Jesus. We are not God. Thank you that we are not you, God, and have to make all these decisions and, and rumble in our minds. We just surrender to you. We submit to you right now, Father. And Jesus, we are in you. Breathe it in, guys. Jesus, we are in you. I am in you. We are in him. Are you there right now? And we take captive right now every thought. Join me in this, guys. We, we take captive every thought of anger we've had against a spouse, against a neighbor, against a coworker, against ourself. God, we take all those captive. We break those agreements. And they bend their knee right now to you, Jesus, to your forgiveness, to your grace, to your mercy, to your love. We're not letting the sun go down anymore on this stuff, man. We don't live in the darkness. We live in the light. Father, in Jesus' name, invade these people. Let no man walk out today with hate in his heart. Let no woman walk out today with hate in their heart. Jesus, let us stand at the place at the foot of the cross, looking at you, hearing your love, reveling in your forgiveness. And let us be just like that willing to lay down our life so people can feel what we feel to know what it's like to be chosen and beloved. God, let it be in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, smash these strongholds. Let them know that that wall is a joke to you. You don't even see it. There's a man that thinks he's been separated from you for years and you've been there the whole time. A woman that thinks maybe it's gone too far and you're right there smiling because you know it's all done. She's coming back. Father, free us. A people marked by nothing but your love. Surrendered. Bowed. Completely immersed in you, Jesus. Jesus.